Welcome to the next section, which will be molecular dynamics and self-organization. And uh, we welcome our first speaker, Caleb Walker. Awesome. Um, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for allowing me this time. I guess it's 15 minutes. Um, and also, it's nice to be going after the coffee break so everyone has their fix of caffeine. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my work on liquid like protein condensates and their ability to facilitate polymerization and bundling of actin filaments in vitro. Um, so if you guys don't or haven't heard of liquid-liquid phase separation. This is not a new mechanism by any means. This has been around for a long time in physics, especially in polymer, in polymers and things like that. But in terms of biology, this is somewhat a newer topic of interest. In the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of excitement about um, biomolecule phase separation and specifically liquid-liquid phase separation. And this is usually mediated by multivalent interactions between these biomolecules. So whether this is from tetramerization or oligomerization um, or interactions between low complexity regions, um, multivalency seems to be a key facilitator of this um, assembly in these biomolecules. And it's been seen to play a role in a lot of different processes, and such as activation of different processes, such as nucleation of actin polymerization, which I'll talk about, but also force generation, localization of different biomolecules, um, and things like that. <clears throat> and so specifically in terms of actin, just a little bit of background about this, um, in case you're not familiar, and I think other people will be talking about it in this session as well, so I won't go too deep into it, but um, actin is a biopolymer that assembles into these higher order networks um, and is involved in different biological processes within the cells, such as Phyllopodia and lamellopodia, which are cell membrane protrusions. In phyllopodia, we have these parallel actin bundles. I think I can point at this. Uh -huh. We have these parallel actin bundles um, that create protrusions from the cell membrane. And in lamellopodia, which is down to the left, we have these branched actin filaments that create more of these wave-like protrusions from, of the cell membrane. And this is mediated through different proteins that interact with actin. Um, we have proteins that can nucleate filament bundling, um, filament branching, creating these higher order networks of different morphologies. And so recent work from our lab, which I'll touch on, which kind of leads into my work, um, was looking at a specific uh, actin interacting protein called VASP. And VASP is this homotetrameric protein that's involved in not only the polymerization of actin filaments, um, but also filament bundling. And recent work by a graduate student who just graduated um, looked at VASP and wanted to explore if we could see this phase separation of this VASP protein because it, we have multivalency and it also has these large regions of intrinsic disorder which are also common among phase separating proteins. And so she, she was able to see that with the presence of PEG as a crowder, um, which using an inert crowder is a common practice in this field to simulate the crowded environment of the cell, so we don't only have, we don't only have this one protein normally. Um, but with increasing concentration, she was able to see the emergence of these phase-separated condensates of VASP. And they demonstrated liquid-like properties, not only with merging and rerounding of these protein condensates, which are kind of like liquid droplets. It's kind of like an oil and water immersion. You can think of it like that. Um, but also, studying the molecular dynamics with fluorescence recovery after photobleaching showed rapid fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, indicating a liquid-like uh, network of interactions. And so, adding actin to these condensates, um, interestingly, she was able to see that we have polymerization of actin filaments in these condensates. So by adding actin monomers and labeling with phylloidin, she was able to see the emergence of these actin filaments that, um, dun, 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 dun. oh, that's the back button, never mind. Aha. Uh -huh. um, these actin filaments stained with phylloidin, and they partition to the inner surface of these protein condensates. And you can see that with um, fluorescently labeled actin on the right. It's kind of dim, but you can see that we have a brightening around the inner surface of the condensate as actin accumulates to that surface. Uh, and looking into this further, we are able actually to see a couple of different morphologies with shells of actin where the 
Um, actin filaments more or less completely covered the inner surface of the droplet. These rings of actin, and then as the ring thickened, it eventually flattened the condensate into a more of a disc-like morphology. And this seemed to be a progression where increased actin concentration led to the emergence of more of these discs and less of these shells. And we actually collaborated with a theorist at UCSD, Padmini Rangamani, and she was able to look and show that the extension of these actin filaments as they increase to a uh, length greater than the diameter of the protein condensate, they partition to the inner surface to minimize the curvature that they experience. And as this ring thickens, eventually it's able to overcome the surface tension of the condensate and deform it into a higher aspect ratio morphology. And you can see this in this video here where eventually we're able to completely overcome the surface tension and it deforms into a rod-like bundle of actin filaments. And so my work is expanding on this a little bit and looking at some of the proteins that interact with VASP um, in the, the cytoskeletal network, and specifically this protein called lamellipotin, which is involved with VASP in both lamellipodia and phylopodia. And so what we did is we created this construct of lamellipotin that's a EGFP labeled, and then it has a leucine zipper, to, which is a dimerization motif to imitate the native dimerization of the full-length protein. And then we have the last 400 amino acids, um, which contain the EVH1 binding motifs that interact with VASP's EVH1 domain. And what we wanted to see is, because we have a high degree of multivalency in the interaction between these two proteins, we wanted to see if we could add lamellipotin and enhance the phase separation of VASP and see what the addition of this protein had, uh, see what effect it had on um, this phenomenon we saw with VASP alone. And we were able to see, I'll just go through this quickly since we've already seen it, but we saw that the addition of lamellipotin facilitated phase separation of VASP, and this was actually in the absence of any crowder. So like I said before, normally we have an inert crowder that facilitates this phase separation. Almost always we need some kind of crowder to induce this phase separation. But because of the strong multivalent interactions between VASP and lamellipotin, we were able to see this in the absence of any peg crowding, which was kind of cool. We still see liquid-like properties. But more interestingly, when we added actin, um, we saw a similar characteristics. So we saw with increasing actin concentration addition, we saw the increased deformation of these condensates. Um, and we quantified this here with increasing actin concentration addition, both leading to a higher aspect ratio on average, as well as a higher fraction of condensates with, um, with a deformed or higher aspect ratio morphology. Um, and just to confirm this, we also did phalloidin staining, which specifically stains polymerized actin filaments. Um, and we were able to see some of the similar uh, morphologies that were seen with VASP alone, where we had these rings um, that deform into these rod-like structures as well. And so this was just kind of cool to see that even in the absence of any peg crowding, which has been shown to induce filament bundling and things like that in actin alone, um, that we were able to see this polymerization without any artificial concentration of the protein that could happen from that crowding. And so this raised the question of, um, we wanted to see what lamellipotin could do on its own. And this was an interesting protein for several reasons, but most importantly, lamellipotin is not an actin polymerase. So it's been shown by some work by Scott Hansen and Dyke Mullins um, that lamellipotin will bind actin, but it doesn't polymerize actin like VASP does. And so initially we thought that we saw this polymerization within these condensates because VASP is a polymerase, so it makes sense that we get actin polymerization in this high concentration of VAS protein in these condensates. And so lamellipotin also displays some of the common characteristics of a protein that will phase separate. So we wanted to see if we added actin to these condensates, um, if we would still see polymerization. We kind of thought that just actin would concentrate within the condensates, but we wouldn't have any polymerization because we don't have polymerase activity. Um, and we saw that lamellipotin can phase separate it on its own. It was liquid-like, all the same uh, assays for looking at that, but with the increasing at act, with increasing actin concentration addition, um, and this is monomeric actin again, we again saw the deformation of these condensates, which was kind of surprising because we don't have active polymerase activity with these condensates of lamellipotin, and we quantified that again. For the sake of time, I'll just same quantification: higher con actin concentration is a higher aspect ratio on average, and higher fraction of condensates with higher aspect ratios. And we have, again, polymerization of actin with phalloidin staining. 
Um, but, but we also just double checked with latrunculin A, which is a small molecule inhibitor of actin polymerization. And when we add that to these condensates, we revert back to, on the right side of these graphs, completely spherical condensates. So we don't have any actin polymerization or um, deformation of these condensates. And so this raised a couple of questions. We were just intrigued because we don't have polymerase activity, um, but we still saw this polymerization. And so we wanted to explore a little bit more of what were the requirements to get this polymerization within these protein condensates. So looking at canonical actin polymerases, um, one thing that sticks out is that they're generally oligomers. So formin and ENA vast proteins are the canonical polymerases. Um, formin forms a homodimer, and ENA vast proteins um, form native homotetramers generally. And it's been shown that in their monomeric state, they don't have that same polymerase activity. And so we tried looking at this with VASP alone, but VASP wouldn't form condensates in a monomeric form um, without that tetramerization domain removed. And so we thought to look at a monomeric form of lamellipotin and see if it could still phase separate and see if we still see this um, polymerization. And so essentially all we did was we removed that leucine zipper dimerization motif and tried to form condensates from it and add actin to it. And we were able to see that we still were able to form condensates uh, and we got actin polymerization again, um, and that's quantified again, which I'll skip for the sake of time. And so then diving down a little further, um, we want to, this seemed to show that any condensate, or I guess it appeared that any condensate that we formed that could bind actin had the capacity to polymerize actin. And so we wanted to look at this a little further. So what we did is we took a clathrin mediated and acidic protein. So this is EPS15, which is an initiator in CME, um, and doesn't have any native interaction with actin. And what we wanted to do is see if we could modify this protein to make it bind actin and see if that would induce polymerization. Uh, and so what we did is first we confirmed that we don't have any, any native interaction with actin. We added actin monomers to this and stained with phalloidin. We don't get any polymerization within the condensates. Um, and so what we did is we added LIFACT, which is a 17 amino acid peptide that's commonly used to label filamentous actin in cells. Um, they'll generally add a fluorescent protein to it and use it to label the actin cytoskeleton. Um, but it also binds monomeric actin as well. So we just stuck this on to the end of, stuck this on to the end of F15 and made this little F15 life act construct, um, which didn't, and that addition didn't have any effect on F15's native capacity to phase separate. Uh, and when we added actin to this again, we saw deformation into these rod-like structures and polymerization, uh, which seemed to indicate that just the addition of actin binding to a protein that forms these condensates is sufficient to induce actin polymerization. And we quantified that again. Again, for the sake of time, I'll just throw that graph up there. But we see phalloid staining as well, and so we get this actin polymerization. Um, and we, again, collaborated with Padmini Rangamani um, and her group to do some simulations and modeling of what was happening and really the minimal requirements that we see for this polymerization and bundling within these protein condensates. And I won't touch on that here, but we have a preprint on BioArchive that has all this modeling, um, which it seems a lot of you are into uh, more than experimental stuff. Uh, and so we have that preprint on BioArchive. It's in review now, so hopefully we'll have the paper out soon. Um, but that, all of that modeling stuff is in there, and we dive into this ring and shell phenomenon and the minimal requirements for forming that, those bundles of polymerized actin. Uh, and so just thanks to my lab, my advisor, Gene Sikowiak, uh, UT Austin, um, Kristen Graham, they're the highlighted one in the grad students, was the one who did the work on VASP, um, and she's doing a postdoc now at um, Genentech, I think. And then Aravind and Danny, which you can see on the bottom, were the ones who did the modeling from Padmini's group. And so just thanks to them as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, so I think Kristen looked about at that in some of her papers. So she did some work on VASP alone, and then her second paper that she published, which I haven't touched on here, uh, looked at ARP23 edition, 
And she was able to see like aster formation rather than deformation into an ellipse only, um, with, and then into a rod. And looking at the energetics of that, uh, she looked at aster formation from the branch actin network. Um, and some of the modeling in her papers looked a little more into that. Um, we haven't, I guess, gone farther than that. Um, but some of the modeling looks at the energetics and really like the interplay between the stiffness of the actin filaments and the surface tension of the condensate itself. Um, but that's mostly what we've looked at so far. Um, any other questions? Okay. Oh. Let's speak. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Our next speaker, um, Luca Pellegrino. for the introduction and thank you for the organization for having me here. So I'm going to quickly talk about my re current research at Humanitas University that deals with the problem of bacterial colonization um, on surfaces and we are actually more looking into the, looking into the uh, interplay of surface topography and hydro hydrodynamics in bacterial colonization. It's well described uh, separately the effect of so topography and the effect of hydrodynamics, but uh, the interplay of the two, not very well. So to do that, I decided to develop a platform that is relying on the mechanical buckling of PDMS to generate um, well-tunable and well-defined uh, cyanide solar surfaces that we can refer as wrinkling. And once we uh, define the surface geometry, it's possible also to calculate the effect of this geometry on the flow field and on the bacterial cells that here are reported as these ellipsoidal shapes, depending on the position of the bacterial cell on the surface and with respect to the flow field applied. But in practical, what we do is we prepare these surfaces and then we create a microfluidic device that has a bottom that is constituted by these patterned surfaces compared to a flat PDMS surface and then we flush, basically, bacteria in this device. These are some samples you can observe. And uh, for this specific experiment, we have the surface, so the 1D sinusoidal pattern that is in the same direction of flow, as you can see from the blue arrow in the sketch, or in the opposite direction to the flow. So a 1D parallel and orthogonal, contrasted to a flat surface. What we, do, we could observe, tuning also the shear stress, so here we have the um, interplay of topography and, uh, uh, and shear. We could observe a reduction of bacterial colonization with shear that is completely opposite compared to what we see on flat surfaces where we have an accumulation, especially at higher shear, shear rates. And uh, moreover, we could also take into account the effect of bacterial motility by specifically working with two different strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, one that is a wild type, so that bears his uh, flagellar motility, and another one that has been depleted of his motility, that is called uh, delta mot. 
And uh, in that situation, we could observe that uh, bacterial motility also plays a pivotal role in the uh, adhesion because by el um, eliciting the flagellar motility, bacteria could uh, behave as inanimated objects, basically, like rods on the patterns. And uh, the selection of the surface was mostly mediated by the way they were adhering on the surface, and the flow was more effective compared also to the wild type strains, as you can see on the graph on the right side. Uh, I want to thank my lab mates and my PI, Professor Roberto Lusconi, and the collaborators, and thank you for the, your attention, and uh, if you have questions, happy to answer. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, any questions? I actually have a question. <laughs> uh, so why do you want to decrease, uh, so what is the application for this wrinkled yeah. surfaces? So the application might be, for example, to trying to better some uh, uh, antimicrobial devices. Yeah. So to develop some sort of surfaces that could enhance the antimicrobial effect of uh, currently available surfaces or develop new platform to avoid attachment, especially in fluidic environments like catheters or other prosthetics that are uh, involved. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and we welcome um, our next speaker, uh, Daniel Cho. Hi, my name is Dayeon Choi in Bamlareb at Georgia Tech. Today, I'm going to briefly introduce the waterscaping behavior of this organism, which is little bigger than molecules and bacteria. Yeah, I hope you enjoy this living system as well. So how fast is the waterscaping mosquito? So we collected the maximum, maximum escape velocity uh, in terms of the body length among other aquatic animals. So blue shades inter represent the underwater escaper, including the sunfish and the rainbow trout. And red, red shades mean the interfacial escaper, including the basilisk lizard and the flying fish. The speed of the mosquito is shown here. And for the swimming speed, it is intermediate among other aquatic animals. But when skipping on water, it becomes fastest for its, for its body length by avoiding the underwater hydrodynamic drag. For detailed investigation, we are raising and observing these two Australian mosquitoes. As you can see, they, can, they have uh, these leg-like fins, which has two joints. And they, using this fin, they can freely move on land. So how do they use these pectoral fins where, when skipping on water? Our high-speed imaging shows that when they are landing on water, they expand their pectoral fin. And they can stay on the water surface, and, they, and it creates the water cavity behind them. And it propels using its tail fin and flies follow, following a ballistic trajectory. This skipping procedure uh, is categorized by landing and reaching the lowest steps, propelling and flying. So upon landing, they expand their pectoral fin, creating a water cavity, uh, and this induces the downward flow. And this water cavity eventually collapses uh, by its surface energy, which induces the upward flow. And the fish then uh, flaps the tail fin uh, under the water cavity, which induces the flow downwards. So we got curious about the interaction between the cavity and the fish. So can this mosquito benefit from the cavity collapsing uh, by the upward motion of the cavity collapse uh, to increase the hydrodynamic thrust? To check this, 
uh, we compare the cavity collapsing time and the flapping time. And we found that the two time scales are matched each other at this fast keeping mode. And at this region, this fish can achieve the higher average velocity. So in this case, fish can retrieve the cavity energy uh, from the cavity collapsing. On the other hand, there is the leg skipping region uh, at which the flapping happens much later than the cavity collapsing time. And th at this time, the fish cannot retrieve the cavity energy from the cavity collapsing because uh, it propels much later after the cavity has already been collapsed before propelling. So takeaway take away is that the muskeeper can benefit from the cavity dynamics in terms of the thrust and can achieve the fastest escape velocity for each body length. Our next goal, next goal is to study how much muskeeper can retrieve the capillary energy from the capillary collapse by using the robotic demonstration. I would like to thank my co-workers and the supervisor in Bamlare. Thank you for listening. Much beautiful talk. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, we usually use the salt water because they only live on the, the brackish water. So uh, I'm not sure how to change the cavity, uh, the, the capillary force, but we are going to study that effect by using the bio-inspired robot so that we can use the other liquid so that we can uh, parameter study the uh, the capillary capillary force and the inertia something like that. Is that because the animal won't swim if we keep it differently? Oh uh, no. It doesn't like to swim. Uh, maybe they they is keeping on the water uh, to avoid the predator underwater, and they actually use this locomotion. Uh, as natural, because I, we assume that this is very efficient, so they, so we we think they use this locomotion behavior. Yeah. Yes. Sure, yeah, we should check the, uh, the contribution between the capillary energy and the gravitational energy. Yeah, so the, we have to check about it and we, we will uh, study using the numerical simulation. But when we see the falling the drop, the experiment of the falling droplet, the contribution of the capillary energy and the uh, gravitational force is half and half. And the Weber number for this experiment is lower than that. Uh, the Cap the falling drawback experiment. So we assume that the capillary energy is more higher than the gravitational energy. So it's kind of small. And uh, we only consider the vertical components of the velocity. So that's why the Weber number is smaller than it looks like, yeah. Thank you very much. Speaker, Akramuddin Tosif. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Akram Tosif. I'm a third year PhD candidate at Emory University under Dr. Shashank Shikhar. Uh, so I'm going to go back to talking about actin a little bit. Um, 
So essentially, some background on actin. So here's a cell that's moving, and everything labeled in the cell is the actin. And actin exists as monomers and as filaments, as Caleb had mentioned. So actin monomers are being rearranged in the cell. But um, in vitro, we don't really understand how we can depolymerize them as fast as the cell is doing it. So conventionally, actin is added to the barbed ends and then disassembled from the pointed ends. So in my research, I'm trying to understand how different depolymerases uh, affect the polymerization or the depolymerization uh, at both ends. So uh, here's the experimental setup. We use uh, turf microscopy, essentially. This is what turf looks like under the cell, under the microscope. Uh, good luck trying to get any data, unless uh, you have some really good undergrads to help you. Um, I recently got undergrad, which is good. Uh, but we don't want to torture undergrads. So essentially, we integrate microfluidics into our turf microscope. Uh, so this aligns us, this allows us to align the filaments uh, with the flow, and then we can just measure the the slope here to get the rates of depolymerization. So the protein I'm ma mainly interested in working on is called cyclose associated protein, or CAP. Uh, here's the domain structure of CAP. Um, so people have studied CAP over the past couple of years, and they found that the N-terminus is responsible for binding to actin, or a filament to the actin, and it hexamerizes. Uh, it kind of looks like this as a hexamer. Uh, the C-terminus facilitates nucleotide exchange. It dimerizes. Um, and my advisor in his postdoc um, found that the N-terminus is able to collaborate synergistically with other proteins to accelerate pointed end depolymerization. However, I wanted to really study what this protein does at both ends on its own. So essentially what we did is purify the protein and flowed them onto actin filament barbed ends. Um, so here's like the control rate for depolymerization for barbed ends. Uh, here's a video of what depolymerization looks like under microfluidics. Um, and so when I float in the protein, interestingly, the filaments depolymerize much faster, and it seems to be a full-fold increase, uh, which no one really has seen before from this protein. This protein was thought to only depolymerize pointed ends and not barbed ends. So we were really interested in what's going on at the barbed end. And in order to tackle this question, we labeled the protein. So basically, how is it doing it? Um, so we labeled the protein and we did the experiment, uh, and this is kind of what we saw. So as we flow in the protein, it binds processively to the barbed end, and it continuously depolymerizes the filaments. And here's just the chymograph of what it looks like. Um, so this was very surprising to us. We didn't expect it to processively depolymerize. We thought it would you know, bind, take two monomers or three monomers and leave. Um, and then we got the resonance times of this protein, and it seems to be binding for three to four minutes, which is surprising because most proteins don't bind this long. Um, and we can also tweak the, the resonance times as well. Uh, and then we were wondering, is this also happening at the pointed end, right? So we, we flipped the experiment set up, had the pointed end free, and then we basically did the same experiment. And indeed, we do see it persistently depolymerizing the pointed end. So for the first time, we saw a protein depolymerizing both ends persistently. And you can see it here. Uh, the depolymerization rate does increase for pointed ends, and the resonance time is actually much higher, around nine minutes, which is even more surprising. Um, but all this said, we also wanted to know, okay, if it's binding the barbed ends, is it able to interact with other barbed end binding proteins, like formin, as Caleb has introduced? Um, so yes, indeed, it does bind to uh, barbed ends and tracks co and co-localizes with uh, formin. So this is the formin uh, fluorescence, and then we have the cap fluorescence, and they're able to co-localize co together and track the barbed ends. Uh, however, the polymerization rate doesn't change if cap is there. And then we were wondering what's going on. So what is it doing? So it's actually increasing or decreasing the dissociation rate of formin. So it's allowing formin to stay bound bar, uh, onto the barbed ends for longer. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at a different barbed end binding protein called uh, calving protein. Uh, so interestingly, it does co-localize with calving protein, but it has the opposite effect, where it's increasing the dissociation rate. Um, so in conclusion, we basically develop like multicolor single molecule microfluidics turf. We saw these new activities of this protein. Um, yeah, and then we were trying to develop this model. Uh, as you can see, this one protein can do multiple things. Uh, and we were trying to understand what else, what's its main responsibility is in the cell. So thank you to everyone um, in the lab for helping me with this project and NIH and Emory for funding. Uh, there's a preprint on BioArchive if you want to learn more.
much. Any questions? Okay, we will. Oh. Um, we're just measuring the average rate of depolarization. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we welcome uh, Katya Krasnopeva with the next talk. Hi, uh, I'm Katya, and today I want to talk about uh, the swimming of bacteria and how the proportionality between flagella motor speed and proton motor force is not as universal as we think. So here we see some E. coli swimming by rotating a bundle of flagella filaments, and if we zoom in, then every flagella filament is attached to the bacterial flagella motor here. Um, bacterial flagella motors are found in many different bacterial species, and they differ slightly, but the main structure remains the same. Ouch. Um, yeah. So you have a flagella filament attached by the elastic hook to the rotor that is brought to motion by the stator units. And the stator units are powered up by the flux of protons in case of E. coli. And uh, uh, yeah, so there is a channel in the inner membrane of the stator, uh, in the inner membrane associated stator unit uh, through which protons come in and the released energy is converted to the kinetic energy of the motor. So it is very clear then that the proton motive force and the motor speed are closely related. And indeed it was demonstrated back uh, in 1995 by David Fung and Howard Berg that if you power up the uh, cell envelope directly, that the speed of the flagella motor that you observe is directly proportional to the voltage that is applied. And the voltage they measured down to minus 150 millivolts. But I put this number in red here because it's going to be important for the rest of the talk, because the 150 millivolts is the voltage that was applied to the entire cell envelope. And in case of E. coli, which is gram negative, the cell envelope includes outer membrane, cell wall, periplasm, and the inner membrane. And the gradient that motor feels is only through the inner membrane. So what exactly motor felt, we cannot really say. But anyway, the, some, the proportionality up to a certain proton motive force was established. It was further generalized to different loads in the next experiment by the same lab where uh, two motor speeds of the two motors on the same cells were measured simultaneously. And here you can see the uh, cell is attached via one motor to the surface, and so the body rotates slowly. And then it has also a little bead, 0.4 micron bead, that rotates fast. And then by changing the proton motive force and observing the speeds of two motors simultaneously, uh, they concluded that both, both speeds are proportional, and since the slow motor speed is proportional to the proton motive force, it means everything is proportional to everything. And so this is a, a kind of idealized flagella motor diagram of torque speed characteristics. This uh, characteristic uh, such, well, plateau and the knee and then decline uh, between the torque and speed were measured uh, experimentally. And so since the speed and <coughs> proton motive force are proportional at every load, then this proton motive force lines here, how do I point? Um, proton motive force lines here, oh cool, um, are equidistant. So that if you, yes. So if you take two proton motive force regimes, two proton motive force regimes, and you look at the change in the speed at two different loads, you will see the conserved ratio. But since it was only measured up to a certain proton motive force, we asked the question, how universal this proportionality is, and is it conserved at high proton motive force? Because as we know, uh, bacteria can go uh, down to minus 
200 minus 220 millivolts, so we were not sure that it's actually gonna be still proportional. And we used uh, this bead assay to vary the load on the motor, and so we use the attached cells and we look at single motors and we can vary how much of the load uh, motor, motor experiences and we can vary then the prod motor force to see uh, how conserved the uh, pro proportionality is. So here is just an example of one an experiment. Here we use a very small bead, 0.35 micron bead, and uh, we measure the motor speed in the media with no glucose and with high concentration of glucose. And we see that the, here is normalized to the no glucose condition. And we see that with the, this small load, we see a twofold increase in the motor speed. So we can assume that the protomotive force is probably changing twice, which is consistent with what we know about metabolism of uh, E. coli. And then we did the same thing for other loads. And it turned out that the proportionality is, is not really conserved between the loads, and uh, the increase in motor speed depends on the load, and the higher load you expose, um, the, the motor feels, the less of a change we observe, which is not consistent with this picture of the motor that we know. So then we thought, okay, with glucose, we cannot really control protomotive force that well, and we cannot go down. So instead, we uh, used a protonophore to go from the very high, the top prot uh, protomotive force here, down to the lower values of protomotive force. And we use butanol for that because we already uh, characterized it previously. It, it behaves as an uh, ideal protonophore and the protomotive force scales inversely with the concentration that we applied. So this is very nice to titrate protomotive force. So with a light bead, again, we recovered this uh, 1 over C dependence that we expected from butanol exposure, and then with the higher load, we uh, recovered exactly the same reverse proportionality, but the higher the load, the more we were deviating from the expected 1 over C behavior. Yeah, and it was scaling with the load. Again, uh, this is very much not the case for the idealized pictures, we know, and uh, yeah, if we look at the change in the speed with, with butanol concentration, indeed it depends on the butanol concentration, but it also scales with the load almost at every concentration that we look at. So we thought maybe there is something wrong with our understanding of proton motor force dynamics. So we looked at also at two motors on the same cell. We grew this filamentous cell where we could uh, use the measure the rotation of two different motors on the single cell. And we attached beads of two different sizes, 0.5 micron bead and 1.5 micron bead, uh, whose response was dramatically different in previous slides. And again, here we treated cells with different butanols, and here you see data from six different elongated cells. And uh, each cell has multiple points, like cell one here. And what we saw was the saturating curve, rather than a proportionality curve that we expected, again, from uh, our previous knowledge. And in the control experiments with two beads of the same size, the expected proportionality was observed. So this is in direct contradiction now with the, uh, this work from Gable and Berg. And we cannot explain it fully, but we can assume that the design of the experiment here was such that the two rotations were not independent. Because if you have a fast rotating bead on the top, then the cell will be doing a controtation even if there is no motor here at all. So the proportionality there can be explained by the fact that the rotations are actually coupled and it's not due to the protomotive force that they are proportional. So we then looked at how torque curves look like. And when we convert the speeds from that experiment that I showed you before to the motor torque, it looks like all the high um, load curves converge into same value at the high proton motive forces. And this seems like this is the value that actually limits the proportionality thing. So there, supposedly, there exists a limiting torque somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 picanewton nanometer, which actually cannot 
go any higher, and this highest torque we can achieve at the physiological protomotive forces. And these are just individual curves, so, so that you can see how it looks like in linear scale. And these are all very nicely um, fitted with the saturation exponential uh, that you use, for example, for charging a battery, which is a linear process that is uh, saturated at some point that has a maximum. So we then asked, is this any relevant for actual swimming? Because maybe these high torque values are just never reachable by the cell, so it never experiences it. But since I'm asking this question, you can guess, then the answer is yes, it is relevant. If we do the same experiment with butanol, uh, but then here we apply different concentration of it to the free swimming cells, we see that the response the, swimming, the change in swimming speed lies between the 0.5 bead, where, which did not show any saturation, and the first saturating load, this 0.75 bead. So it is just at the edge of the saturation regime. And if we increase the load on the mode of the free, free swimming by adding FICO and increasing the viscosity of the media four times, then we see again this shift in the uh, response, very similar, well, actually identical to one that we saw at one micron bead load. So again, it shows that, that the higher load you have, the less of proportionality you have left. And if I plot this swimming with FICO uh, against swimming with no FICO, we again recover the saturating curve that is very similar to the one that we saw on the individual motor level, which means that this behavior translates directly from single motors to the swimming behavior. And uh, since we have all this data, we can also plot the actual torque speed curves, not the idealized one, but uh, the actual data ones. And well, it doesn't, ex exhibit this kind of sharp knee that uh, you see on the cartoons. But um, if we place the uh, free swimmers between 0.5 and 0.75 loads, that this around the knee is where cells actually swim. So basically the conclusion is that this picture that uh, we used to think as the motor characteristic is only correct at low proton motive forces. And what we think is needed to be done is to be corrected with uh, this maximum torque that collapses the high proton motive force curves into the same uh, line, basically, if you achieve the maximum torque. And the blue region here is the region which is torque speed space uh, that is available for the swimming cells. Because this line here is the swimming in water but it's not given that they always swim in water, and in fact, with more viscous environment, uh, cells actually go into the more saturated regime. And if I have another minute, I can even speculate uh, about why, why the motor is such. So we don't know why the motor is such. We can assume that it could be that it evolved just enough to be under the saturation, and that uh, cells want to achieve the maximum speed with maximum uh, proton motive force, but it did not evolve any further. This is if we assume that swimming in water is the most relevant for E. coli. Now, if we assume that, in fact, the swimming is relevant in mucus, where they live, which we were not sure about, um, that we can also speculate that this could be advantageous to have uh, speed insensitive to the proton motive force, because if you have the environment where, where your proton motive force is lowered, you don't want to lose the speed there, and you want to avoid accumulations in the areas of low proton motive force. So this is basically the conclusions for this work, and I would like to then wrap up and say thank you to the labs, my PhD lab in Edinburgh, and specifically to Lucas, who did all the free swimming experiments, and to Law Lab in Taiwan, where I did most of my measurements, and my home lab in Austria, the Goyat Lab. Thank you very much. Lots of questions. We only
only looked at E. coli. We only looked at E. coli. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what, what was like the, the absolute The good question. We would like to know that. Uh, the problem is we cannot really measure it very well. In uh, E. coli, we can measure the delta pH component, but the membrane voltage component is something that we struggle to measure uh, precisely and quantitatively. So we are just assuming that it is uh, on the order of magnitude of 200 mi minus 200 millivolts, because theoretical prediction for the respiring regime in order to uh, actually produce ATP with one, F1, F4 ATPase, you need to be lower than 170, 175 millivolts. So if you are a respiring bacteria and this the condition we use are respiratory conditions. Uh, that you would be higher than that. So definitely higher than what was measured before uh, in terms of like direct powering of the cells. Yeah? Well, yeah, we can chat uh, at any time. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. The next spe speaker of the section, uh, Guang Bench Hu. Yeah, yeah, correct. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Guang Peng uh, from King's College London. I'm really happy to give a talk here. Basically, my work is more about the kinetics calculation of a uh, uh, glycine receptor, uh, one binding. And the glycine receptor belongs to the pentameric ligand gated ion channels and uh, uh, widely spread in the nervous system. And uh, it is important in the signal transmission between nerve cells. And uh, it is uh, uh, important to understand the uh, unbinding mechanism uh, of the uh, glycine receptor um, because uh, uh, it is of uh, therapeutic uh, importance because the glycine receptors are related to several uh, diseases such as uh, chronic pain and the uh, spinal cord injury and also uh, alcohol drug uh, dependence. So in my work, uh, we are mainly focusing on the uh, revealing the mechanism of, of unbinding at an atomic level. And the, how the uh, ion channel work, uh, essentially ion channel would uh, uh, embed it in the membrane of uh, nerve cells. And when the ligands bound to the receptor, the ion channel would be triggered to be open. And the, the ion channel would select a specific type of ions to permit through. And if there's no ligand bound to the receptor, the ion channel would be mostly maintained at the uh, closed state. And then the ions cannot permit through. So in this way, ion channels uh, regulate the voltage between the two sides of uh, the membrane. And structurally, uh, ion channel uh, has uh, three domains. Sorry. The upper part is uh, the ECD domain, which is uh, isolated outside of the membrane. And uh, there's a, a transmembrane domain, uh, which is uh, crossed through the membrane. And it also forms the, form the, forms the ion channel pore. And there's also an intracellular domain. Uh, because the binding and our binding events only happen within the uh, uh, ECD domain. So we truncated this structure, and we built the ECD model. And the ECD model was, uh, is assembled with uh, five identical uh, subunits from subunit one to five, and a pair of them can form one pocket, and each pocket can bound with uh, uh, one ligand. And previous uh, uh, experimental work uh, has done, uh, showing that uh, uh, the occupancy of the ligand to the uh, pocket uh, can affect the unbinding and binding uh, rate. So based on the, this idea, so we built uh, four models with different uh, occupancy of the ligand. 
and uh, we built the four legacy model based on the uh, PDB entry 6 PM5, and we simply ejected two or three of them. We got the three and two legacy model. And uh, we also built a, a zero legacy model from the PDB entry 6, 6, 6 PSD because uh, um, when there's no legacy inside, so uh, the ion channel is closed. So, uh, so the first three models share the same structure uh, because the, the ion channel is open, and the, the last one uh, is different, slightly different of the tails of the ECD. So we do this simulation uh, using uh, for, uh, all item MD molecular simulation, and we use a uh, amber force field and we do each uh, model for one microcycling MD simulation, and then we do analysis. And I, I, as I said before, two pairs of subunits can form one pocket, and they, it's shown here, and one is the principal, the other is a complementary subunit, and the principal subunits can be a complementary subunit for the uh, neighbor pocket, and likewise for the complementary subunits. And the uh, several loops comes from, uh, come from the uh, two sides of a subunit from one pocket, and the radius on those uh, loops um, are constantly interacting with uh, the ligand uh, in the form of a hydrogen bond and the chitin pi, and also ionic bonds. So, uh, glycine uh, ligand is uh, the most efficient one for glycine re receptor. As we can see, the, the pocket here is very compact here, and mostly due, uh, throughout the trajectory, there's only one water, which is uh, colored in the uh, orange. So the water molecule acts as uh, like a water bridge to help st uh, stabilizing the ligand binding. So when there's more water pops in the pockets and the, the water molecules would uh, disrupt the interaction between the ligand and the uh, binding residues. So first thing we have measured here, we measured the water number inside of the bond pocket. And what we found here for the four ligands model, and all the pockets are identical, so they were expected to behave to behave the same, but they didn't. We can say the pocket A has the highest number of water molecules, which indicates that pocket A is less stable. And for the two ligands model, and the, the, the bars are lower, which implies that uh, the two ligands model are more stable. And the interesting thing for the three ligands model, so we can say um, the pocket B is more stable, and uh, while well, the uh, pocket C and E is the less stable. Another thing we have measured is the, the our retention of loop C, uh, as uh, illustrated here, because uh, the loop C fluctuation directly affects the uh, pocket shape. If the loop C move outward, so the pocket would be expand and more water would pop in. So, um, and if the uh, loop C move inward, and uh, the loop say would squeeze uh, the water to be outside, and then the pocket would be compressed. So what we found here in the zero ligand uh, model, and the, because all, all the uh, pockets are empty, so they were expected to behave so well they didn't. So we can say that three of them are more fluctuated, and two of them are more um, relatively stable. So we think that probably the pocket uh, uh, cooperated between each other. So then we checked the pockets uh, interplay. We sim if we simply plot the loop say angle of present pocket versus the neighbor pocket, uh, you may find that um, they tend to show um, opposite peaks, uh, not always, but often. And uh, we use the loop say angle as the uh, input to calculate the uh, peers in correlation, and uh, we found that, uh, yes, they are correlated and mostly negatively correlated. And the interesting thing is here, 
uh, one pair of the pockets when they are politically related, and the one, one pocket from the pi pocket, the pair pocket, tend to be less stable, because uh, uh, in the Foligan's model here, um, say uh, uh, E and A positively correlated, and uh, uh, in water analysis, the pocket A is less stable. And uh, in the three ligand model, the B and C positively correlated, and uh, say less stable. Well, B is uh, more stable because uh, A and B is relatively higher, uh, with higher uh, negative correlation. And also here, likewise, um, uh, D and E, I think. Uh, okay, and the E has the highest uh, uh, water number molecule inside, and uh, likewise for the upper model, uh, loop C has the highest uh, uh, loop C angle of, of pocket C, and the, for the two ligands model, uh, the positive ones are almost zero, so two ligands model are more stable. Okay, uh, another thing we have done is uh, uh, the kinetics calculation of uh, unbinding, and uh, here's a technique that we applied here, because the unbinding process is considered as a slow process. If we do this kind of simulation, we need to ac accelerate it. So we use uh, the metadynamics, the enhanced symphony method. Uh, the general idea is that uh, people should choose the collect variable. Like here for the unbinding, we use a distance between the the pocket and the ligand, and then metadynamics would deposit bias potential on the distance, and then the ligand would be able to escape from the original bound state to the unbound state. And uh, now, uh, there's a, a concern about uh, doing the biasing stuff, uh, that uh, people should avoid a deposition on the transition region. So we developed this uh, program that um, we, the general idea is that we uh, fastly deposit the bias potential on the bundle state, bundle state because there is an energy well. Um, and then we linearly increase the deposition rate after the bundle region to avoid the deposition on the transition region. Because we want to get the time to calculate the unbinding rate, so we need to repeat time because the time is, uh, the simulation time is biased. And the, the hypothesis we made here is that the unbinding process is a, a reverse mechanism of uh, binding because the binding mechanism is like uh, initially the pocket is open and then the ligand bounds to the pocket and then the pocket is closed. So we think that the uh, unbinding process should be like uh, uh, the pocket should open firstly and then the ligand eject. So yeah, that's the hypothesis. And the collective variables we used to calculate the pocket open, one is solution, because if we open the pocket, so more water should pop into the pocket, so we need to accelerate the solvation environment surrounding the ligand. It makes sense. And another collective variable is the, the contact map. Contact map, uh, it is a group of distances uh, between the um, uh, binding residues of two sides of a subunit, and the, the collect variables we use for the ejection is uh, one is the solvation, the other is the distance. Is, uh, is distance. Um, another technique we applied here is uh, a tube potential to constrain the, the unbinding pies. Because the pocket is, is big and the ligand is, is very small, um, so it's very hard to control uh, the unbinding pies but mostly the ligand would follow a common path. So uh, we added this technique um, to guide, because uh, we only focus on the common path of ejection. Um, yes, so. And uh, first of all, if we want to uh, eject the uh, ligand um, follows the common path, we need to find out the intermediate states and then we do um, we started the unbinding path. So what are we done here? We have done 20 replicas um, f as a trial replicas. And then we use this, this data from these replicas. And then we do clustering stuff using 
uh, a machine learning stuff called self-organizing map. And then we got clearly uh, three groups here. So we got uh, the intermediate state one and the intermediate state two. And finally, we uh, define the unbinding pairs. Um, it is suggested that the unbinding pairs, the ligand moves close, a bit close to the complementary subunit and uh, slightly bottom up direction. And then we do this ejection from state to state, like here from pocket closed state to the pocket open state. And because the ligand is still within the pocket, so the, the ligands are still um, interacting with uh, the most residues of the binding residues. But the occurrence of this, these interactions are reduced. And then from pocket uh, open state to the intermediate one and the two intermediate two, basically uh, the scenario is like uh, ligands breaking uh, old interactions and then form uh, new interactions. So we do this step by step, and each step we have done 20 replicas, and then we uh, did a KS test, and uh, all the p-values uh, are not great, but uh, good enough um, to above the threshold non-point non five. And uh, here's the experimental time, and this is the pocket open time. And you may find that the ejection time is, uh, is very short. So between the two sides of uh, uh, pocket open and ejection, it's kind of like a trade-off in between. So if we well open, the pocket open time should be uh, longer and uh, making the release of the ligand easier. So the ejection time should be shorter. If we slightly open the pocket, making resulting in the uh, ejection difficult. So uh, open time shorter and the ejection time longer. So um, using this protocol, we are doing a partial ligand uh, for this, and we can compare that. And uh, this protocol can also be used for um, drug design, for any agonist, and also any um, drugs developed. Uh, thanks to my supervisor, Colin Montenegro, and thanks to all my collaborators. Thank you. Very much. Uh, any questions? I didn't uh, really catch you, sorry. So, you have your open pocket. Yes, yes, yes. And you have your closed pocket. Yes, yes. And my question is, what is known about glycine receptor in terms of how many fold the affinity for glycine changes with the closing of the pocket? Oh, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, round two or three because before we have a line uh, the, the pocket open structure and the pocket closed structure. Basically, the main difference comes from the loop C and the loop B. Uh, the, the, the changes vary more. Um, yes? For, for ACH receptor, it's 10 to the fourth. That's the fold of the change of the affinity with the activation of the channel. So it's quite a bit. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, even even the difference of the loops, uh, uh, the distance uh, changing, is not uh, significant, but the volume um, is big. So the, the change of volume is big. So uh, the bind pocket, the volume basically, sorry, uh, basic basically uh, in the range sixty to one hundred, and if the pocket is open, so uh, it's one hundred to one hundred fifty. So um, even though the fluctuation of the loops uh, is not very big, but uh, it affects the space uh, quite a lot. 
if I may say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you. I think we need to move on. Uh, thank you very much to our speaker. And, um, and I welcome fellow UMDN, uh, Nathan Zimmerberg. So I'm going to be talking about modeling the um, mechanical and chemical interactions between non-muscle mice and two filaments and actin filaments. So a brief overview of non-muscle mice and two. Um, it's a hexamer that forms this motor protein that walks along actin filaments. So each um, molecule has two motor domains that actually bind to the actin. And then around 15 to 30 of those molecules form into these uh, bipolar filaments where the motor domains are concentrated on the ends. So the myosin filaments are around 200 nanometers long and they can interact with actin filaments, multiple actin filaments at the same time and kind of slide them relative to each other. And even each end of the uh, myosin filament can interact with multiple actin filaments. So zooming in on a single motor domain, each motor domain um, uses up ATP to convert, to create a mechanical work. And so in my model, I'm using a kind of three state model where the, each motor domain can either be unbound, weakly bound, or strongly bound. And as it goes through the cycle, it um, consumes one ATP. Okay, so for modeling the mechanics of the system, I'm using the uh, median force model, where we coarse grain filaments in terms of strings of cylinders. And then each um, cylinder has a number of different forces. We have bending and stretching rigidities, as well as volume exclusion that prevent two cylinders from overlapping. Uh, in addition, the, when the motor domains bind, they create additional spring-like forces between uh, multiple filaments. Okay, so then we, we need to combine the mechanics and the chemistry together. So to do that, we use this median cycle where we evolve the chemistry stochastically, and then that in turn updates the um, mechanical potential energy, and we equilibrate the network which creates new forces, which then update the chemical reaction rates. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some simulation results of just a single myosin filament walking along an actin filament. Um, so one thing in the ATP cycle of the motor domain, each of those steps, um, or some of those steps are very dependent on the forces. So some of them have catch, catch bond behavior. So here I'm showing that um, the kind of net walking velocity of the myosin is heavily dependent on the force sensitivity of the different reaction rates in the cycle. Okay, so in conclusion, non-muscle myosin two walking velocity is highly dependent on its uh, force sensitivity of its reaction rates, at least in this model. Um, and the implicit Brownian dynamics can be combined with the stochastic Gillespie algorithm to model both mechanics and chemistry in, in complex systems, while also ensuring numerical stability even with huge time steps. Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge my advisors and current lab members and previous lab members who worked on Median. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question? How do synchronize these Uh, 30. Yeah, so, well, that's, I think, where the kind of force sensitivity comes in. So if you have one 
um, motor domain that is kind of pulling, and then you have another a motor domain that's get, getting pulled in the opposite direction, that might speed up its unbinding. And since they're all kind of connected to the relatively rigid filament, they all kind of have a shared um, force. But there's no, besides the, the force sensitivity, there's no synchronization. Everything is uh, just stochastic kind of chemical reactions. Thank you very much. Um, and we have, unfortunately, two cancellations of the talk. Um, so I welcome Wen Chen Ji. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here and present our work on design principles of transcription factor with intrinsic disorder regions. This work suggests a new search strategy for transcription factors. TFs are essential for gene regulation. They are proteins that bind to a specific place on the DNA to promote or surprise transcription process. Effective regulations requires TFs to rapidly bind to the correct target in eukaryotic cells, for most TFs, besides having a DNA binding domain, they also have intrinsic disorder regions, which are unstructured amino acid sequences. The size of IGR is several hundreds of amino acids, whereas for the DBD, it's much smaller. In experiments done by our collaborators' lab, they can gradually cut down the length of IGR to see if it affects TF binding specificity. Here you can see the, they found that binding specificity decreased with the cutting length. This suggests IDR enhances the binding probability. It also suggests TF with IDR has a short search time. Inspired by this experimental result, we ask, can we understand this search efficiency by use polymer physics? And are there any design principles? Let's introduce our model. We cost green the TF by using the well-known Ross model, where beads stand for DBD and IDR side are connected by springs. Based on the experiment, there is a region called Atina around the target that guides the IDR to find it. Here you can see. So we assume TF with IDR specifically interact with the antenna. We look at the search time, or mean first byte time, where overdump dynamic is adopted. Initially, TFs are random positioned in the nucleus. Once they find the target, the search ends. We optimize the search time with respect parameters such as antenna length L, binding energy, and IDR length. We find that opti the optimal search process involves a single round of 3D diffusion followed by 1D diffuser. What does this mean? The TF undergoes the 3D random walk initially. Once TF, TF, TF binds to the antenna, once TF binds to the antenna, uh, it transitions to 1D random walk before reaching the target, until it reaches the target. Interestingly, when we observe the 1D random walk motion, the TF behave like an octopus. The IDR site, the IDR site act like tentacles, detaching and reattaching frequently. But TF rarely falls off from the antenna. We call this uh, motion octopus in walk, inspired by the John's famous repetition walk in dense polymer systems. We also check that uh, this octopus in walk is in a dynamical steady state. We can obtain the third time, which is uh, uh, given by the 3D third time plus 1D third time. You can imagine that the, uh, if the antenna length is longer, it's advantage for the 3D search, but not for 1D search. So there's a trade-off between 3D search and 1D search. 
Here are our simulation results. The 3 d third time decreased with the antenna length, but the 1 d third time increased with it. There is an optimal length, L, which is much larger than the target size. Let's compare the third time. For simple TF without IDR, the third time is proven to R cubed. R is the uh, nuclear size. Whereas for the TF with IDR, the, total, the third time, the minimum third time is proven to R square. In real parameters, the third time could be 50 times shorter than, compared to simple TFs, even though simple TFs have a large diffusion coefficient. Here is the summary and take home message and the acknowledgement. I will stop here and take questions. Thank you. Okay. So how is your results compared to the Ah, uh, good question. Actually, uh, we collaborate with the experiment list. Uh, yeah, I mean, our model is by the experiment, experiments. And of course, it's a simplified model. We also propose some experiment later on. We will check it, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we can decide later. But you showed like the, at the beginning, like more detail. Yeah, you mean yeah. this one? Yeah, this paper, yes. Uh, it, it, you know, it's very hard to measure the dynamic properties, but, but I mean, yeah, we, we, we propose some experiment, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Ah, yeah. So, I don't know if it's easy, but uh, you said that the optical setting idea, so basically that uh, maybe you actually just want to spend the optical optimization for optimization. Means monkey bite. Means monkey bite. You mean this is a monkey bite effect? Uh, monkey bite effect. Oh, okay, so know. Yeah, uh, this, uh, here we consider this is uh, specific interactions. For the monkey bite effect, it's uh, non specific interactions. Okay. Yes. You mean that mass for mass for TF or mass for IDR? Ah, uh, yes. This is a good question. Actually, you can see here uh, because of IDR, actually they uh, make the target more specific, specific. That means I mean they don't bind to other place. I'm not sure. I I'll say your question. Yeah, we can talk later. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I apologize, but we need to move on. Ah, Thank you very much. You. Great talk. Uh, and we welcome the last speaker of the section, uh, Gloria. Clearly, these were also made for people who are much taller than me. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Gloria from Paul Sullivan's lab. I know you're all hungry, so I promise I'll try to make these 15 minutes go by as fast as possible. So, as my title suggests, I'm going to be looking at comparing absolute numbers of ampar subunits and hippocampal neurons using QPaint. So, let's fo first get into what the heck is an ampar and why am I spending the next... Oh, does this... So why am I spend why am I going to spend 15 minutes talking about ampars to you when you all want to go eat food? Well, an ampar is an ampar receptor, and it's basically involved in learning a memory formation. Ampa is basically a glutamate. So if you're familiar with your basic neurotransmitters, this is one of those excitatory neurotransmitters. Um, and this ampar, the ampar receptors are actually very much the ones that are involved in learning and memory formation. Also implicated in Alzheimer's disease, etc. So that's why we want to study these. Um, 
Next, so an amphoreceptor is basically a tetramer, so it has four possible zip positions, and it has four subunit types. And these four subunit types are very creatively named GLUA1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and so basically, any, in theory, any four of these subunit types can, uh, can occupy any of those four positions within a single amphoreceptor. Um, I want to also highlight that one of them, GLUA2, is the most common, and it functionally changes the amphoreceptor. It makes it calcium impermeable. And because it is the most common, we want to also look, this kind of motivate why we're looking at the different subunits, because calcium permeable amphars, so those without containing the most common subunit, GLUA2, those are actually required for the maintenance of memory. So, fun fact about these amphoreceptors, the most common ones are thought to be GLUA1, GLUA2 heteromers. So they, that means two GLUA2s, two GLUA1s. You could kind of, you could see a canonical amphoreceptor here where we have GLUA1 in purple, so two of those, and then GLUA2 in green, two of those. So they were thought to be 80% just like those. Um, but there was a recent cryo-EM paper that showed that there are pos more possible combinations where you can have three GLUA2 and one GLUA1, yada, 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 which is great, but what, where's the truth and where, what are we looking at anymore? So we're gonna, I'm going to start looking at this with fluorescence microscopy, and fluorescence microscopy allows us to study intact neurons. That's going to be important. I'll get into that in a second. But, we also, but the big questions we want to look at are how does the amper subunit composition change as a function of distance from the synapse? and over time and over neuron activity. So I just said the word synapse. What the heck is a synapse? Great question. Um, but they, amphoreceptors actually exist in the synapse, and those synapses are the site of neuron communication. So if we take a look at my little cartoon here. If, nope, there we go. Um, so here you would have one neuron. This would be the presynaptic neuron. I actually don't label this, so we can't see it. But in between, so you'll have the postsynaptic neuron, which is labeled, and those are where all your amphoreceptors exist. And you can also have fine markers. There is something called a postsynaptic density. A lot of scaffolding proteins live there. That's where we're going to use as a marker for our synapse and find those mature synapses. So basically, if I overlay this cartoon over my very nice uh, micrograph, you see it right here, where we have the post uh, post-synapse synaptic neuron labeled, and that's the ones we're looking at. So we're, this will allow us to visualize receptors as a function of distance from the synapse. That's great and dandy, but synapses are really freaking crowded. So if you've noticed, there's a length scale here where basically a synapse is about 200 nanometers to a micron in size. That exists largely underneath the diffraction limit. Um, but this is also a very simple cartoon, and if I wanted to make it slightly more realistic, um, basically, you would have multiple different types of receptors and also multiple different types of scaffolding proteins in your postsynaptic density. So again, this makes conventional fluorescence microscopy very difficult. Um, so basically, the crowding and size of the synapse is going to require super-resolution microscopy. Okay, that's great. Um, how does super-resolution microscopy work? For those of you who are not familiar, basically, you're going to kind of sparsely label, or you're going to label all your proteins. And then you're going to have them turn on and off. So in here, you can see, oh, this red one's on, and then maybe later another red one is on. And then you're going to localize those, fit each of those with a Gaussian. And then basically, you're going to get something that is super-resolved over here. There's a lot of different ways you can get a super resolution, storm, palm, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to use any of those. I'm going to use DNA paint. Why? Well, DNA paint is kind of cool, and how does it work? Well, you label your receptor of interest, so, or your protein of interest. In my case, it's an AMPA receptor, and that is going to have a DNA, one single strand of DNA. We're going to call that the Docker strand. And then you're going to flow in the complementary strand to that in a bath, and that is going to be, that complementary strand is attached to a fluorophore. We're going to call that the imager strand. And basically, you're going to be able to see these as they bind on to the Docker strand and then off. You won't be able to see them. So you'll have a certain K on, on rate, K off, off rate. So how do you get, so when you do something like that, you get the same kind of thing, same blinking that you would get for any super resolution method, you get a nice little time trace where you could have on times and off times, and just like before, you could super resolve something here, like a neuron. So what's great about DNA paint, why am I using it over storm, palm, et cetera? 
Well, DNA Paint has really reliable blinking kinetics that don't depend on anything like UV or on anything on the photophysics. So basically, it only depends on your imager concentration and your DNA sequence. These are both things that you could very easily manipulate. Um, and there's also no photo bleaching or illumination artifacts. So that means when I make the, take the K ons and K offs from this time trace, this is really dependable. And because those are so dependable, I could actually use these to derive absolute numbers of molecules. And how do I, you, how do, I do that? That's a process called Q-Paint. So Q-Paint is, is called quantitative paint. It's the way to get absolute numbers using DNA paint um, data, basically. How that works, first, you take, um, you calibrate with where you know there is a single molecule, and you're gonna pull out a certain time trace, right? So you'll have an on time, an average on time, we'll call that tau b, and an average dark time. We'll call, we're gonna call that tau d star. This is for your single, what you know is a single emitter. And then you're gonna take a region, let's say one of these red circles, where you have an unknown number of molecules. So again, you're gonna have a certain tau b, certain on time, and that's gonna stay relatively the same. But because you're gonna have multiple spots for a new imager strand to bind to on these Docker strands, you're actually gonna have more on events. And what that's gonna cause is your dark time here for your region of interest is going to be smaller. So that average dark time for this region of interest, we're just gonna call tau d. So basically to get n, all you do is divide tau d star, your average dark time of a single emitter, by tau d, your average dark time of your region of interest. And that, so n is the number of molecules in your region of interest. Great, fantastic. Um, so let's go back into what I'm working on. So again, remember, GLUE1, GLUE2 heteromer. We basically thought they're all, that all these AMP receptors, 80% of them, they're gonna be GLUE1, GLUE2 heteromers, but there was a paper that came out, remember, that there showed that there are more possible combinations. So where's the truth here? So because these are possibly contradictory, I'm gonna use the DNA paint to look at these, if I, see if either is true within the synapse, and then understanding the subunit composition could also provide us with more insights on how learning works. So here it is, my first set of data. Um, so here you can see um, on, I have a nice little super resolved image for the most part. Um, I have Life Act, which is just my filler to look at neuron morphology. And then I have my Homer, which is one of the postsynaptic density proteins. And that's how I'm finding the synapse. And then we have GLUE1 in pink and GLUE2 in yellow. And then you can see that all merged here. And so, now, that's great, it's a really pretty picture, so what, let's get the numbers. So first, which was really surprising to me, is that when I counted the numbers of the synapse within 300 nanometers of Homer, basically I found that we have about 20 GLUE2 and about 10 GLUE1, and that is significantly higher. Um, so that is obviously very surprising if you're expecting them to be 80% one to one. And of course I wanted to see, okay, is this going to be, does this apply across all synapses? It just a few, few weird synapses with a lot of GLUE2? Um, nope, so when I take the ratio of GLUE2 to GLUE1, um, basically I find that number is significantly greater than one. So basically GLUE2 subunits outnumber GLUE1 subunits in the synapse, which was surprising. So our next step is what, what are these excess GLUE2 bound to? So then I moved away from GLUE2 to GLUE1 and I went to the next most common AMPAR subunit, which is GLUE3. So I get a nice pretty image. Uh, this takes advantage of another fun, um, uh, another fun part of DNA paint, which is makes multiplexing really easily. So the same thing here, I now have a six color image where I have my life act, I have my homer, and then I have three Ampar subunits. So GLUE1, GLUE2, and GLUE3. That's great. So I've, I've imaged all of those. Now, I guess I have to count them. So when I'm looking here, I have, Again, significantly higher GLUE2 than compared to GLUE1, so about 20 GLUE2, 10 GLUE1. But what's interesting is that we find that the number of GLUE2 is also significantly higher than the number of GLUE3. And then, but the number between, the difference between GLUE3 and GLUE1, that's not significant. So when we look at the ratios then, so again, just like before in my previous experiments, which was GLUE2, GLUE1, ratio of GLUE2 to GLUE1 is significantly higher than one. The ratio of GLUE2 to GLUE3 is also significantly higher than one, 
But when I add, take this combined number, so I add the numbers of GLUE1 and GLUE3, and then compare that to the number of GLUE2 within the synapse, that is not significantly different than one. So this is kind of implying that GLUE3 makes up for the excess GLUE2 subunits within the synapse, and it could also imply that GLUE1-2 heteromers and GLUE2-3 heteromers are equally present in the synapse, which was not expected. So as kind of, you might have noticed that a lot of my images, the amper receptors seem very clustered. There's these little bots, little blobs. So I've started doing some cluster analysis as well. Um, this was with great help from my undergrad, Max Winger, who did a lot of the coding. So first we identified a cluster and then we pulled out a time trace. Just like we could with my circles, my regions of interest, we just pull out a time trace that we can then apply Qpaint on. And then I could also zoom out on these clusters and look at the clusters in, in relation to other clusters, in relation to Homer, which is this green triangle. And so for now, what I've gotten is that I pulled out different clusters of GLUE2 and GLUE1, and I've compared their densities. And so while there have been previous studies on GLUE2 clusters, there haven't been so much on GLUE1 clusters. So while my, my data here on GLUE2, it's actually, it's, pretty much matches what has been found before, but not. But then we, what we find is that the GLUE1 cluster density is much less. So that's pretty interesting that there's these possible differences between these nano domains. Um, and so basically my cluster analysis is gonna be extended to GLUE3. I'm also gonna be looking at relations to Homer and other such things. So uh, what are my future directions in terms of this? Well, a lot of the data I've showed you exists in this middle ground where it's basal, just neural, just normal neurons living their neuron-y life. Um, but there is something called LTP, which is basically, like I've been applying a lot, it's the, we're looking at learning and memory formation, and LTP, long-term potentiation, is believed to be the molecular mechanism of that. So my next goal is to basically simulate LTP and see how these subunit numbers change, basically over time, whoops. And that's just changing during and after LTP and also applying something for, to see what, how we can um, alter that. So to conclude, um, remember, so I, we had, we, when we started this, we were thought that they were 80% GLUE1, GLUE2 heteromers, and that there, but there was a paper that showed that there are possibly more combinations shown by cryo-EM, so we weren't sure where we were. Um, so where are we right now? Well, my Q-paint shows that GLUE2 outnumbers GLUE1 in the synapse, um, and what, GLUE3 appears to make up the difference between the GLUE1 and GLUE2 synapse, so definitely within the synapse, they are not 80% GLUE1-2 heteromers, right? Um, and there definitely seems to be more possibilities. Um, and I have early cluster analysis that show differences between GLUE1 and GLUE2, and hopefully my work, future work will be focusing on mimicking memory formation. So just to end, I'd like to uh, thank my lab back at UIUC, in particular my two undergrads, Max Winga and Dirk Shaw, who have contributed a lot to this project because I can't code very well in Python. Um, I'd also like to thank my collaborators, Professor Eric Gu at OHSU, Professor Hee Jung Chung in the neuroscience department at UIUC, as well as Pro Professor Nick Wu's lab in UIUC biochemistry, particularly Tim, who purifies and expresses all my uh, antibody fragments, and I'd like to thank the funding sources as well as the organizing committee for inviting me to talk today, and I'll now take any questions. Any questions? Yes? Uh, I want to. So what I showed with that, uh, uh, I showed with the clusters briefly. I didn't show that I also have the clusters of like, I think those were GLUE2 clusters, but also have GLUE1 clusters overlaid, and I hope to do an enrichment analysis, and also a centroid to centroid distance comparison. Um, any more questions, or everyone is ready for the lunch? Ready for lunch. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.